Now, um, I'm going to recap what we have talked about so far. Now, we started talking about this concept of molar Gibbs energy in terms of uh, the pure substance. So we have focused on So that's something we have been, let's say if you have a pure gas that we call, let's say A, and the molar Gibbs energy we have is established, uh, that will be the total Gibbs energy by the mole. So we used this quite a bit. We have uh, found it very useful when we described phase equilibrium, you know, ice, water, vapor, so on and so forth. How, when, whether sense will be equilibrium, or whether ice will be melted, so on and so forth. Okay, this is very useful. And then we made one sort of a conceptual jump in the last two lectures, right? Which we find out when we actually mix up the gas A into, in that case, we have B, but in principle, you could have many other mixtures in this. Uh, situation. Now we have, through the two lecture of discussion, we find out in this case, this particular gas A, it's molar Gibbs energy, it can no longer be simply just calculated that way. They are actually related when, let's call this, we actually call this a pure time, or like a pure gas A, that's basically weak. How, so let's see, if I actually bring the asterisk to indicate it when the gas is pure. Now we actually um, realize the molar Gibbs energy of this particular substance uh, become lower compared when it's pure. So that's what we end up doing. We spend so much trouble just going back and forth, try to explain to you this is true. And hopefully by now you're not doubt about it. I'm just write out this chemical, this mathematical formula. But this mathematical formula is really established uh, on the experience we have talking about when you have two gas mixed together, it'll be spontaneous. And that whole common experience, uh, if we just kind of summarize in the mathematical language, that's what it is. Yeah. Okay, so, but recall um, we have set up two goals last time uh, for today's lecture because we want to look at this as because this thing is so actually commonly useful in the future, we actually call these um, chemical potential. You know, you can think of these as just a special, the molar Gibbs energy in the special form. So, Sometimes you can actually just replace this uh, this molar Gibbs energy into a simple, you know, we can call it kind of like okay. So this is what we have been achieved so far. So you might notice this. Um, once we have been. I mentioned last time, I want you to say, okay, now when we talk about this as a potential, usually means this is something that we might be uh, used as in analogous to like a potential energy on the gravitational field. So when you deal with that, you often want to compare as a reference point, or otherwise it's hard to you, for you to give an absolute value of, um, of a particular potential energy. For example, you can't really say, oh well, what is the real value of a potential energy of A in this mixture? Now, usually, so this is actually uh, the, the question I want to address very quickly today. That is, how do we select a reference point when we talk about something we name the potential? So in this case, we call this chemical potential. And the chemical potential of gas A, uh, after all the two lecture discussion, we know it's related to pure by the molar fraction. Of course, I want to write this molar fraction of A here basically is uh, the mole of the gas and 
and get in, in the case we actually uh, use just B, but in principle you could have many other gas total. Whatever the uh, fraction of gas here you have out of the whole system, so this is the temperature pressure. So uh, this is basically what we have achieved to that two lecture. Now, you might say, gee, this is easy. We don't have to worry about the reference point because this could be our reference point, right? Every time we just use our pure state as a reference point, that'll be easy. So we don't have any worry about uh, choosing the reference point when you talk about uh, a potential in this case. However, I'm going to, this, the second thing we want to achieve is that after this, after all this discussion, you realize that when we use molar Gibbs energy, we can actually use this in solid, a liquid, and also gas. So you can do, you can apply the molar Gibbs energy concept to any phase form of material. But you realize that we actually have used ideal gas behavior to derive this equation. That is, we know when you mix ideal gas with other gas, this particular ideal gas is molar gas and it gets uh, discounted, devalued, whatever the appropriate words you want to use, is by this relationship. So you, you can say, wait a minute, well, I'm not sure what you're saying is actually going to be applicable when we deal with non-gas form, right? So that's a fair question. So then, then, then all of the discussion become highly limited. It's not very useful uh, if we are only able to talk about chemical potential in the ideal gas space. And you know, this class is for biological system. So we mostly deal with solution. So, that, so that's the main focus of today's lecture. So, but before I get to that point, I want to have a, a, another open discussion that may be familiar, pretty simple to most of you. So, um, so I'm sure you heard about this thing about gradient, right? Diffusion. If you have have something uh, a high concentration, uh, they tends to diffuse away into a low point. So in fact, I'm just curious, like how many of you actually? no example of a gradient that uh, control important biological process. Okay, yeah? Yeah. Um, in embryo development, oh, there's like gradient of different signals which like will help cells know whether they're like in the, where on the axis they are and like which ones should become which type of cells? Yeah, no, that's actually a very good uh, classical example in the uh, embryonic uh, development where you have the uh, anterior posterior uh, polarity establishment, uh, the, uh, the protein or RNA come from the maternal side during the early phase of the fertilization, they deposit one spot, they create a gradient and then that will determine where is the head, where is the tail, basically, is what Talia's example. Now I noticed Justin, you actually raised your hand. Do you have a different example or the same example? For ATP synthesis, there's a proton gradient. That's a very good example, too. So Justin is our uh, perspective uh, children that might be choosing us. So uh, our class have been opened up to uh, perspective high school students who are within us. So welcome to the class. That, that's a really good example, yes. Uh, so another very common phenomenon is the gradient across the cell, the ionic concentration gradient that can be used to generate energy. So clearly gradient, uh, the, the phenomena of gradient are everywhere, okay? And you almost don't even question why. So right now, so if I just simply point out is that I'm going to stop talking about the gas for the moment, but I'm already started to probe in your uh, intuition in this case. Is that is, if you have a gradient of any sort, 
So generally, what we mean by that is whether it's uh, the, the morphogen gradient control the embryonic development, or the ionic gradient across the cell membrane that involving a neuronal signal construction or energy uh, driven ATP synthesis. So gradient is a phenomenon that you can say have A in the solution. Let's just say, well, I can even draw an embryo. Just, and this is not a very good one, but if you have a high concentration at a certain point, so there are going to be have a, a sort of a diffusion point. So you would have a higher concentration here, and you have a lower concentration here. So now, based on all discussion up to this point, what do you think is the thermodynamic driving force for a matter that go from high concentration to low concentration? Now, I haven't talked about it. I just want you to kind of guess what, what I've been talking about. Austin. Yes. So that goes all the way back to entropy. But right now, we are touch up on something called Moral Gibbs energy. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron, don't snap on your. <laughs> I don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah, but take a while to guess. So uh, we said like if we, uh, if a molar gaps energy of uh, of ice is higher than the water, the the water is going to just transfer from the ice to water when you when you apply pressure or heat heating, right? So in this case, take a while to guess. What do you think the molar gaps energy of the matter in a high concentration zone? Compared to the low concentration zone, who is higher, who is lower? The high, mm -hmm. the high concentration, you get the high. The, yes. the partial like it's higher, so you take away less. Yeah, so you almost guessed it, right? So you say, so what we observe in the ideal gas behavior, like we know the molar gas energy gets higher when the gas is pure, right? But uh, when the uh, the molar gas pressure gets uh, the molar fraction of this and in the whole ideal gas gets lower and it's uh, molar gas energy lower. So it's just much harder to say molar gas energy sometimes also it's confusing, you use the G so we just start to not talking about as molar gas energy anymore you say the chemical potential because when you say my chemical potential it gave you the hunt, this intuitive feeling like I'm going from a high potential point to low potential point. That's just much more intuitive. So it's so from this for for this reason we started to kind of stop using molar Gibbs energy from here on. But in essence, from the Gibbs energy point of view, it is just um, another way to say molar Gibbs energy. So the chemical potential, now I'm gonna just change the word the way we say it, of a pure uh, substance is higher than when it's a mixture. Now that's one statement. The extension of that statement is that a chemical potential of a substance in any uh, environment, when the concentration is higher, its chemical potential is going to be high, than, higher than when the particular substance in the same similar temperature pressure, same temperature, but in a different zone, its concentration is lower, then its chemical potential, chemical potential in there is lower. So then the matter has the tendency to travel from the high uh, chemical potential zone to the low chemical potential zone. You might say, gee, you know, I don't need to do all of this, because I already know this. I drop a, a blue ink in the water, you'll diffuse, so I don't want to do all this mathematical formula. Uh, but, you know, the point is, I hope later we'll come back to the question that Justin just pointed out. I want you to say, hey, uh, yeah, I know, so the purpose of this discussion is not just predicting when a matter is going to travel from high gradient to low gradient. Um, it, we can be more quantitative. We can calculate what sort of diffusion can, uh, rate would be. So this would be very relevant to the situation where Kalia mentioned. When we want to turn on a particular gene for a zone which will shape the body part, then you would be able to calculate uh, the actual gradient uh, if you know more quantitative relationship. Now, more importantly, is if you are to actually calculate how much energy you'll be getting out of it, if you transport a particular matter from a certain concentration to another, how much energy you get? Well, that is the reason why today we want to 
we want to basically leap from the discussion of gas phase into a solution. And we want to convince you that we have a way to consider those two questions I just mentioned, use chemical potential. We not only can predict how things will move, we can even predict when that move from a point A to a point B, how much energy can be generated, or how we can predict a particular uh, concentration will result from this sort of transfer process. All right. Any questions so far? Are we agree this is a useful topic to do all on for today's remaining time we have? Yeah, Iris? So the other PCHEMs also go with chemical potential a lot, or is this because we're doing the life science? Oh no, everybody does chemical oh, potential. Oh yeah. No, is uh, I'm trying to use biological example here, but there are a lot more other application of chemical potential way before uh, the biological study has uh, used this concept. But it's just it's very also very prevalent in the uh, biological system. Okay, so now how do we how do we actually get we we get here by using a lot of uh, uh, ideal gas law, right? So now we we got stuck. There's no solution that we can calculate. So let's just try to uh, use another sort of real life example to get us some kind of uh, uh, way to relate back to what we already know. Okay, so this is how we go. We start. We try to address the question, but we go back to where we have already established. But before we get that, we have to introduce another phenomenon where, uh, <coughs> where you can probably relate it to. So let's say I have a, um, a solution which is made of water and alcohol. And so you might actually uh, of course, if you're a very experienced bartender, you can smell how much alcohol from the gas vapor pressure, and you can tell, hmm, this is a whiskey, this is not a beer, because the amount of alcohol in the vapor pressure tell you what in the solution, how much alcohol you have, all right? So this is where, this is gonna be the clue how we gonna make the jump from gas phase into solution, okay? So that means something about the vapor pressure uh, can reflect what's in the solution. And the first person who recognized this is a French scientist, his name is Raoult. So he actually, I don't know whether he worked as a bartender or not, but that's a side point. I mean, this is just an example. The whole idea is that you can observe in a uh, series of sort of exp empirical or experimental or what, however you do it. And you can actually compare, uh, let's just say in the case of, uh, if I have a pure ethanol, let's just say at a certain temperature pressure, and then you would have a vapor pressure here of the ethanol. And then you have the uh, liquid form of ethanol. Okay? Now, then you start to dilute your ethanol, right? And, and they really depend on how much, so of course you would actually, uh, you can dilute at any other arbitrary fraction where when the ethanol in the liquid is a certain number, right? So you can you can you can you can make what was the beer's percentage? Most of you are on age, so that's not a fair question. Okay, so it's about seven percent. <laughs> then the wine is thirteen percent. Yeah, I really know you know you just pretend you don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> just uh, no, and the, there are just basically the point here is that you can actually um, uh, do this experiment. And then you can measure the pressure, the vapor pressure of the ethanol at a particular point. So you can basically do this experiment. So, and then obviously you can collect a lot of data points. And you just find out, oh, it turns out it's pretty interesting. Uh, you really 
depends on, uh, so if I actually make this uh, vapor pressure pure form as a, like, just a, like a little asterisk, this, this is the pure, the equivalent is a pure astronaut. Right? So if, if at the same temperature pressure, I have a bottle of ethanol that's pure, I measure its vapor pressure, which is P star. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then if you actually start to dilute it, Aaron, sorry, I'll just make fun of you. I can see. Yeah, didn't mean to. No, okay, no, so, no. yeah, so basically then you can find out for every given uh, percentage of the fraction you're making out of the the molar fraction, you can define this molar fraction as ethanol's molar fraction equal to <coughs> its more of ethanol and more of ethanol and more of water. Uh, just to be fair, maybe now I should put H2 in here. Okay? So, if we're, and then we discover that So this is not uh, something we derive. This is uh, basically um, a new law that's not as broadly related to the first law, second or third law of thermodynamics, but it is uh, based on experimental observation. And then we summarize in a quantitative relationship. And then this is something we have to use to make the jump from the gas phase into the liquid. Thank you, sir. All right. Okay, yeah. Justin, good. So. Any question up to this point? All right. So. So when you say to make the jump from the gas phase to the liquid, this is still the vapor pressure. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm going to get that. So my point here is that I want to show, in fact, I want to tell the answer first, and then I want, I want to see if we can work together to figure this out. And then if, you, we, we, if we all work together to figure it out, it probably be better than I just write on the answer to you, right? So my point is I want to know if I can do the same thing with ideal gas, because I know the ideal gas when I have a pure form, I have a pure this, and I can get the pure, uh, I know if I have a mixture, my uh, motor Gibbs engine is decreased by this, by whatever the pure form, then it gets the motor fraction. I'm asking myself that if I have the ethanol's chemical potential, or you know, let's say a motor Gibbs energy of the ethanol, uh, and then right now, I'm just, and then I'm, I'm, I'm writing this still, just so that you know we're not confusing ourselves. So, and in this case, I call this motor gives, and it's pure uh, ethanol uh, plus. I want to know if this is possible. Or, you know, sometimes we just, decide not to write this anymore, we just call these ethanol pure plus. Makes sense? So let me just rewrite this one more time. So what I'm trying to get at is that I want to know if for ethanol there are um, I have a chemical potential that uh, I can call a reference point that is a pure, just like we did here, right? We have a gas that's pure. Now when I mix up the gas with a bunch of other gas, I know my motor gives an edge or chemical potential. In this case, I can also call 
these normal locations. A. Now, I'm trying to ask myself, can I describe a solution as molar Gibson energy or chemical potential using the same <coughs> principle we had established here? So I want to ask if this is true, or if how can I prove it's true or if it's not true? Now this is a little bit tricky, but we'll see how we can go about it. So, so it, but this is actually the goal. You almost say, hey, yeah, that sounds right. Uh, that's about right. Or then, how do we actually kind of a mathematical or using some sort of a argument to show this is the case? So this probably is too complicated for us to read. So I'm going to go and then ask questions and see what we can do. So what, what we need to do is right now is uh, we have to somehow relate this to that. Right? This liquid, pure, there's a pure ethanol chemical potential, or molar gives energy. Uh, that's in the liquid form, right? And but here I'm I'm not dry. I'm just talking about ethanol right now, because that's the only thing I can smell. The other thing I couldn't really smell at the moment. So I'm just so now I'm gonna focus on this also ethanol, except it's not uh uh it's not pure anymore, but it's mixed up with water. It has a molar fraction. So this is E T O H, um, but this is E T O H. But I, I'm going to stop writing E T O H when I write out here. But I'm just put it here so you know what's going on. Okay, I'm trying to relate the liquid form when it's pure, uh, and also the liquid form when it's in the solution. And how do they compare to each other? And I want to show if they differ by this amount, right? And obviously, we don't know how to use the liquid. So we have not done anything with the liquid yet. But what we're good at is we're good at with gas. Yeah, so that means we have to figure out how to relate to the gas. So this gas must be related to this guy, don't, don't they? How are they related? First, let's ask that question. I'm talking about they're there, they're just sitting there. So what is the chemical potential of this uh, the vapor gas that's also pure form? How, the, how are they related to each other? Are they equal or different or the same? Or, or big, one is bigger, one is smaller? Austin? Yeah, but I answer, I, you are saying the right thing, but answer the direct question, which is, the gas ethanol in this pure form and the liquid ethanol in this pure form, are they equal or one is bigger, one is smaller? You actually... <laughs> are they what? Okay. Spacing? Well, don't get scared when I draw them in this you know, chemical potential for my... If I just say molar gaps in the of gas, of molar Gibson energy of the liquid, and then they are the equivalent, they are equal. We already talked about the phase diagram, right? That's basically what it is. So uh, they're the same. So the first thing we made a, a jump is okay for the for pure ethanol, we know its chemical potential in the pure, the liquid of guys, and the chemical potential of the vapor of guys, they're equal. So don't worry about this. This chemical potential, just because we start to switch the symbol uh, much more frequently here on. If, if you have some any doubt, it was just with molar Gibbs energy in this case, because we're still talking about pure. It's only when they're in a closed container. Like oh, yeah, when they're equilibrium. I'm saying they're, because, you know, assuming they're equilibrium, you know, obviously, if they're open, my uh, analogy of, of of this button that was just, you know, kind of a hand yeah, load also, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But th that's basically what I'm trying to say, is they are equal, right? So that's, that's one good news. And similarly, if I have a mixed water and ethanol solution, obviously, in the vapor case, case there are also vapor of water uh, and also vapor of ethanol. 
Now, since I'm only concentrated on the ethanol, so in this case, they uh, basically the solution for uh, the for ethanol also. And then now they're not pure anymore. But one thing I can be sure is they're at equilibrium. The water and model gap percentage had to be to the uh, water vapor. The uh, ethanol motor uh, gap percentage has to be equal to its uh, motor gap percentage in the gas phase. So basically, in this case, they are equal to. This is at, is at equilibrium. Yeah. So, so basically, uh, I'm talking about the at equilibrium. Yeah. Oh, we're also assuming this. So, so let's probably just say this is enclosed. Oh, they're just equilibrium. They, they, we're assuming this is an equilibrium discussion. Otherwise, it'll be un, indefinite, undetermined. Yes, Aaron? I don't know if this is a bad question. But I'm looking at the molar fraction. Yeah. And so for the solution to be equal, and that way that we said the first one's equal, so now the molar fractions have to be equal to, right? Say that again? So, well, okay, so since the U with an asterisk is equal, we just, and we're setting the, like, the general solution equal, the RT, LN molar fractions have to be equal, right? So that means the molar fraction has to be equal? Which one has to be equal? The molar fraction <laughs> of, the, of the ethanol in the solution and the ethanol in the gas phase. Uh, not quite there yet. Uh, not really, because uh, the the no, okay. not that never really. Uh, they this molar fraction was actually referred as molar fraction in the solution. So when he did the experiment, he only can measure. This was so early, hundred years. So there's no good way to measure it. But uh, he can always weigh up a certain amount of volume, of the, uh, like a two quarter, two cup of ethanol, one cup water. That I can do. So that I, I can, I can oh I can weigh it up and know the molecular weight, and then I can do the calculation. So all of this molar fraction is referring what when I make up the alcohol, I know what I put in, right. and then I can then I find out how much I smell. I mean, obviously, it's not a smell; they can actually measure uh, by some other measurement. They can measure how much ethanol. Because when I'm putting the vapor, there might there must be more ethanol. There's more ethanol fraction right. as well, but the, let's not worry about it. But it is pretty okay. much right. what it is. Yeah, right. so it's a. Uh, so um, uh, let's let's just use what Raoul's measurement tell us how to deal with this for the moment. So it's actually so if so if this any other question. So so the, the, does this make sense, people? Because we are not trying to use uh, more adequate. I'm just trying to okay. If this measurement is true, or if this law is true, which is true, people have done many measurements. They have already realized this is what happened. So then this gave us a very good uh, handle of trying to figure out what, what to do. So, but now, like, okay, so uh, how do we actually express the uh, gas phase? So the gas phase, I know the gas phase can always be related to some kind of uh, pressure point, right? So last lecture, I have stopped by saying that if you can relate the pressure, uh, relate the uh, pure gas pressure and the partial pressure if, if we have impure. So basically, if I know the ethanol, now I'm only comparing uh, gas with ethanol, okay? And I have an ethanol gas, I have its pressure at P1 and P2. How do I relate their chemical potential? So last time I kind of quickly stopped here. I want you to go back to uh, finish the discussion. One is we basically uh, converted the molar fraction as a partial pressure. So basically we have used the PA over P to uh, tell you that's how we can uh, choose the pure pressure P point as a reference point. Or you can actually do virtually something. So let's just stop here for the moment. So if I want to use, let's go back to, this is, let's go back a little bit. Let's use the molar right, So we'll go back to the old trick. Uh, we, we know the uh, temperature. So now, and then I'm 
really, if I only care about the pressure, so right now we are talking about the pressure can cause the difference in the uh, molar Gibson or chemical potential. So we can act pretty much uh, for any uh, ideal gases. So basically, now, like I said, we won't change this into uh, chemical potential from here because they're, the, they're equivalent in the pure form. So you can basically say that the chemical potential change uh, could be simply the molar um, the volume, not at fixed temperature. Right? So the second tensile, the dt is zero. Now we have done this before, and we end rt over p, right? Because it's one more pv with one rt. So then the more of the the chemical potential change of uh, of any ideal gas over a temperature range would be the chemical pressure at the second pressure point the chemical pressure of the first pressure point that's what the left side really means The integration to the right side, we have done this a lot. Expansion work, entropy calculation, all this, so on and so, so on and so forth. Okay, now, this is just review what we did before. I'm going to pause for a moment. Any question on this side? I wasn't planning initially to review this, but don't, don't rush to write down because this first tape. Second, I'm going to spend a few minutes to go over this. But this, my point is that uh, we have a way to, for gas, which I did not, I went too fast last time, so I'm going to, that's why I do want to spend a few minutes to tell you that, yes, it generically we can use molar fraction, but for the ideal gas, molar fraction can be also translated into uh, partial pressure with total pressure, use Dalton's law, so we get this, right? So basically you can say the reason that for for ideal gas, when it gets mixtured into a lot of other stuff, is because its pressure got reduced. So that was the reason why. You can arrive at the same conclusion by, by monitoring how the molar Gibson edge or chemical potential can change over the pressure. So if some guy's pressure is changing, you are changing its molar Gibson edge. So basically we arrived at the same conclusion from here, it, this is what we did by mixing the ideal gas. Here, basically, I did it by applied pressure. So what I'm trying to tell you is that you almost can answer a question that say, okay, if I have a gas at a, the same gas at a high pressure, and I have another gas at a low pressure, who has a high chemical potential? Anybody volunteer on that one? High pressure? Yes. <coughs> and that, well, then I'm asking, uh, a, a gas at a high pressure and compared with gas at a low pressure, who has a higher concentration? You know, what, what do you mean by concentration? What per volume, how many molecules? So who has a higher concentration? High pressure. High pressure. So basically, high pressure. In, in, for gas, we can always just translate high pressure is a high concentration. And a high concentration is high chemical potential. So everything we end up saying end up converging one point. It is higher potential, higher chemical potential, uh, or higher concentration, higher chemical potential. Now, except only the tricky part is in the gas phase, that can be expanded in the discussion as a pressure and other so on and so forth. But right now, for solution, we don't necessarily translate uh, pressure as a concentration, but you can conceptually relate that together. Yeah, make sense? Okay, it's very important because we have a lot of discussions in gas, because it was convenient for us to do all the mathematical derivation. But I want you to sort of relax and step back and say, oh yeah, okay, everything kind of makes sense. Higher concentration, higher chemical potential. That's what we're going to try to drive into home, basically. And here is the same thing. So here we, now if you get to this, that's good. So now we have a vapor that's ethanol whose pressure is not the same as before. So I can always relate this to, okay, I have the 
originally the pure gas whose vapor pressure has a pure now I have a this P, right? The, so I I know these two are different, different because this is at the pressure P. This is the so how are these two different? Well, I already told you the if the two guys uh, pressure will be different, they differ by this, don't they? Because that's what the concentration difference of the gas. So I basically said, well, okay, from what I know from this, obviously I still assume ethanol vapor behave like ideal gas. So I still have to make some assumption, but that's a reasonable assumption, right? If that really you know. So basically, for a ethanol in a different kind of uh, alcoholic drink, uh, you basically have the the difference of then. Being RT, whatever the vapor pressure you in that bottle, what you can measure, to when the ethanol on the same temperature pressure is pure. Melissa? So we're mixing the ethanol with water, right? Mm -hmm. But what if you have something that doesn't mix with water, like pentane? Or Very good point. In fact, uh, we will uh, they if they behave ideal gas, these gas don't really interact. Or in the solution, uh, when the water don't really uh, have what we call entropic interaction, that is actual hydrogen bond, they're just purely entropic effect as a mixing. And then uh, what I discussed here would be all applicable. But if um, if they if they start interact with each other, then they cause a situation that will deviate what we talk about. But that'll be the topic for the next week when we talk about what we call ideal solution or non-ideal solution. So for ideal solution, you can pretend in. this other guy just don't interfere any of these. Okay, so we will get that point. But today I want to make the conceptual leap from gas to solution. Okay. All right. So, um, how much time? Okay, three minutes. All right. We're good. We're just there. Um, so this is good. So now, basically, uh, this guy equals to the pure guy plus. P and P pure. And now Raoult's law help us a lot because the fraction of ethanol P pure, right? So this we got that one. And then basically the the ethanol molar fraction. Now as almost you can see there in here, since they're equilibrate. The, the gas phase, the uh, ethanol pressure it, it is basically equal to the when it's mixed, the ethanol in the liquid form is chemical potential. And this also equal to when it's pure. So we basically finished the, the leak from gas into liquid. So that basically means when you have, from here on, if we, we don't have to really go around a long circle back, think about it, which is if you have a solution, if you know uh, its molar fraction, uh, you, you, or concentration, you basically knew that its chemical potential is deviating from its pure, by the same relationship we have here. This, of course, uh, has some condition constraint. The, the solution, the, the, the solution should, there's two different solutions. In the liquid, they should just mix in. They only have entropic, entropic mix, mixing effect. But if they get sticking to each other, react to each other, bind more than that, since it gets deviated. But we'll talk about that later. Aaron? Molar fraction using here, now I understand, I think it's just for the liquid. It's just for the liquid, yes. Makes That's sense. the Ravut's law that comes because, and this is something that we have to make you believe because uh -huh. uh, if you don't, just go home practice on your bartending scale. So mm -hmm. then you can see if you can uh, just make enough of the different <laughs> fraction. Yeah. 
Um, so that's pretty much what uh, I'm going. So I, I don't. So this last uh, few lecture, I kind of spent more time because it, it was really important to uh, show you the concept why chemical potential is so useful. And I mean, it's, I mean, it's probably not. The point is really not. So this slide basically is what I already told you here. How do you think about uh, gases? A chemical potential in terms of its pressure. So if you go back and look at this, and I already said that. Um, this is something we have talked about in the last lecture, so you should uh, also be able to go back to review it, because this is how we arrived at the conclusion by mixing two different ideal gas. Bravo's law, when I talked about it, how do we uh, use Bravo's law to make the transition from gas phase into liquid again? Uh, the way to study this course is using this PowerPoint uh, slide as an outline, and I always, these last three lectures are so important in my opinion, they are the, basically the core of this course. So I take all three of them, I call them uh, Introduction of Chemical Potential 1, 2, 3. So they all be uploaded, uh, hopefully you can read it, think about it, and if you have any more questions, you can always come back to me. Now these other things, I tried to do this last year, but I have not brought that equipment, so I don't know how to do it. So I end up just taking the stuff I wrote on the board, and when I read it again, it made no sense to me. So that's why I found out uh, you can you know this part, but I'm just using this as an example. When you see this part, it makes no sense. Go watch the video. So that I will definitely improve that. And so these other thing uh, I was have, uh, trying to explain, but um, so that's I already asked the question. So this will be the subject for next week. That is, how do we actually use this in real situation? We'll talk about ideal or non-ideal. Okay? Uh, I believe we don't have a class on Monday, so we'll see. See you on Wednesday. Next week. Mm -hmm. It makes sense now. It does? <laughs> That's confusing. I, 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 I thought it didn't make sense.